There is a place where old and new meet, where the past touches the lives of those who still walk the streets today, where beauty surrounds every aspect of life, a place of ancient stories that form the foundation of today's cultural renaissance, all in the myths of a thriving modern town. This is Hilo. Hilo is one of the most unique places in all of the Hawaiian Islands. With a vibrant past, it still is a modern city, thriving in a modern world. Located on the northeast side of Hawaii Island, the district of Hilo has a long history that goes back centuries. With fertile lands and abundant water, Hilo has been a center of Hawaiian life for generations. The first moon of the moon phase is called Hilo. And um, this is a crescent shape. Yeah, that's why the bay is crescent it, it was It was named actually for the bay. Um, but there's actually two stories of how it was named. One is because of the shape of the bay, of course, obviously. The other is has to do with the navigator that came here. And the navigator was from uh, Tahiti, one of the smaller islands of Tahiti called Taha'a. And his name was Hilo. And so when he was sent out to uh, explore. Uh, one of the places that they came was, was here. And so many stories talk about this place named after that particular navigator, Hilo. They call him Hilo because in Tahiti they roll the R's. The Moku or district of Hilo contains many Ahupua'a and smaller land districts, the largest being Waiakea, which has been at the center of this thriving community for generations. The people who name these places, these nomenclatures sort of describe the place. And Waiakea tells you that this is a broad expanse of fresh water. And fresh water is continuously flowing. And if you live in Hilo long enough, you're very aware of fresh water because our ocean is cold. And it's, it's a, a little brackish. It bubbles up from underneath and um, constant fresh water we have. So we have all of these outlets of water. We have the rivers. Actually, Waiakea begins at Wailoa River, and then it comes all the way down to Piokaha at the end of Piokaha. Between Wailoa and Wailuku, you have several little Aupua'as. The more fresh water that Aupua'a has, the smaller it is. The less fresh water, the larger it is. And that's why we have Waiakea being very, very large, because it doesn't have a lot of surface water. Okay. The Wailuku River, of course, is our largest river. And it goes all the way up to Mount, the top of Mount Akea. About runs about 26 miles. The other river, of course, the other waterway is Wailua, and Wailua means long river. We used to have a lot of fish ponds in Wailua River, and uh, Wailua River as well as Waiolama are the the waterways that provided all of the lo'is in that front area where we had the parks, and where they play soccer and ironworks, they used to have a lot of lo'i in there. It was full of uh, uh, food. These areas of lo'i kalo went back to ancient days as laid out on this map from around 1800. The ali'i, or chiefs, had the Wailoa River and the Waikea ponds set aside for their personal use. The ponds were well known for their fish that grew in brackish water, such as mullet and ava. In this picture of well-known Hawaiian legislator Joseph Navahi's house in the 1800s, you can see taro patches in the foreground. For centuries, Hilo and the Bay were at the center of the traditional way of life as the common people, or maka'ai na na, worked as planters, fishermen, craftsmen, and laborers. Hilo has also played an important role in Hawaiian history as the place that Kamehameha the Great achieved significant milestones in his life. It's the reason that a statue dedicated to him sits in such a prominent place near the bay. This area is where he built a fleet of 800 warring canoes and launched his campaign to conquer the major Hawaiian islands. Uh, the canoes that he readied for his, his battles were made here in Hilo. And so all of the logs were brought down from, because the forest was very close. 
And so it was very easy to get the big trees down to Hilo. And you had all the waterways. And so that was a good way to bring the, the, the big logs down, get the big logs ready for all the big pelele, the double hull canoes. Another significant event that happened in this area is when Kamehameha had encountered a small group of men who hit him over the head with a paddle, yet spared his life. From this experience, Kamehameha issued a law that protected common people and is included in our state laws even today. That's where the law of the splinted paddle comes from. There were thieves and robbers that came after them. And then he got into a little battle with them, a little skirmish with them. And um, he was hit on the head with the paddle. And uh, so that's where they get the law of the splintered paddle. And from then on, they made this law that people who walk along the, the, the pathway, that they had all of these little trails, um, should be left alone and, and not be hindered by thieves and people who want to take things from them. Hilo was also the place that Kamehameha fulfilled a legendary prophecy by lifting the Naha Stone, a 5,000-pound stone that still sits in front of the Hilo Public Library. The prophecy states the one who would lift the stone would unite and rule over the islands of Hawaii. It was during Kamehameha's time and after his death in 1819 that the traditional way of life began to transition as outside influences such as the sandalwood trade and whaling industry brought significant changes. In 1825, Lord Byron transported the body of Liho Liho, or Kamehameha II, back from England after he suddenly died while visiting there. When Byron landed in Hilo, he estimated that the population at the time was about 2,000. Missionaries began arriving in Hilo as early as 1822, and Haile Church was founded in 1824. In the 1830s and 40s, under the direction of Titus Cohen, Haile grew to be one of the largest, if not the largest, church in the world, with 1,700 people baptized on one day alone. During this time, called the Great Awakening or Revival, Hilo had only 2,000 residents, yet the church grew to over 10,000 members. This church had great importance in this community being what it is today. This building was uh, dedicated in 1859. We had five buildings, this is our fifth, but the ministry uh, was, was uh, East Hawaii wide. Uh, so during the time of what we call the Great Hawaiian Revival in the 1840s and 50s, thousands of country people came here to see what God was doing. And because of the inconvenience of frequent travel, they made homes, businesses, and settled down. And so Hilo became the second largest city because of the church and because the people wanted to be a part of what God was doing here. The interesting thing was how the church itself and the values of the Christian faith um, did not conflict with the Hawaiian values. In fact, they actually merged quite well. Uh, so the Hawaiians already had uh, this whole idea of kokua and of uh, aloha and of uh, kako'o, helping one another, and all, lo, lo, lokahi. All of these words were already in the Hawaiian language and in practice uh, in the Hawaiian culture. So when Christianity came along and said that these were values and these were things that, that Christianity uh, treasures, then it, it became uh, very, very quite, uh, the two were very compatible. This growth of Hilo Town continued as the first store opened in 1837 and Governor Kuakini began three different sugar operations by 1839. The sugar industry began to grow rapidly with the Reciprocity Treaty of 1875 between the Kingdom of Hawaii and the United States. Hilo became a business hub for shipping sugar overseas as plantations spread from Kau to Hamakua. Plantation, you know, started way back in the 1800s and uh, one of the first plantations to start in Hilo was Waikia Mill, which is uh, where the Hilo Motors is located and Waikia Villas. And the cane fields ran all the way up to uh, Waikiuka way up Waikiuka, the last cane fields. They had railroad tracks all the way up, and railroads brought the cane down to the 
to the mill. And then they, what was interesting when they, after they processed the sugar, they ran it down to the uh, docks by what they call scows. In Wailua, they had gates they used to run it through and then down to the docks. They never had sugar trucks. They only had scows, which is interesting. As the sugar industry grew, they brought in people from all over the world to work on the plantations, including Japanese, Chinese, Portuguese, Korean, Spanish, Puerto Rican, and Filipino workers. Most of these workers lived in camps located in the different areas of the plantation. And the camp started out as, you know, the Portuguese camp, or Japanese camp, Filipino camp, but eventually they all merged together because uh, the language, they had to talk to each other. And uh, I think sports had a lot to do with it because they wanted to win and they took the best players from the different groups. No matter their race, these immigrant groups got along with each other and fit into the local community. You know, everybody got along with everybody. Nationalities didn't mean anything. And I tell my grandkids sometimes, I, I think I even ate dog, because when we were growing up and we were playing in the camp and the mother would say, hey, lunchtime, and we're going to the house and she would put it on the table and we would eat and talk and never ask what we're eating. And uh, we never thought about asking. And, uh, but we had, I had good fun growing up in the camps. By far the largest group of workers that came to Hilo were Japanese. They came on a three-year contract normally to work for the plantation. And a lot of them, after working for the plantation, they went start their own business. That's why we got a lot of signs here about uh, plantation workers started their own business. And a lot of them kept working for the plantation, but they had their wife or kids work for the store and they lived upstairs. That's why then Japanese kind of took over. Hilo became the end result of the plantation experience, sort of like in its best qualities. In, in other words, well, the people really relied on one another and they helped one another despite what ethnic groups they were from. We all had to share that common culture of being very simple and very uh, industrious people. And because we had found ways not just to survive but to thrive um, in the plantation. During the plantation years, Hilo grew into a thriving community that began to look like the Hilo of today. As times changed, it transitioned from a town that was dominated by horses to one that was connected by automobiles and trains. Larger Hilo had a number of smaller areas that were considered their own town, such as areas of Waiakea that went all the way to the ocean. Waiakea town was, uh, you know, on both sides. When you 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 uh, when you go over the river today, uh, over the bridge, you know, going towards uh, the airport, you cross over the Wailoa River, and that was Waiakea town on both sides. We were very populated because you had Coconut Island and uh, Banyan. And the little Kalani Park was there and a, a lot of homes, even they had a elementary school there. Elementary and intermediate. Waikia Town was, was uh, a lot of Japanese, uh, had some Hawaiians, Filipinos, we were, we were mixed in the group there. It was, it was a town by itself. It was a fishing, fishing town too. Um, we had a movie house, uh, had several barber shops, uh, several pool hall, had a bar, skipper's cove. Uh, it, it was all about the, the, the uh, I guess sugar cane, and the trains used to run through our town. So I always remember when I was a young boy, I used to go watch the trains. In the Wailoa River, there's a turnaround station where the train would turn around and uh, go across the river and then go to uh, La Pohoehoe uh, to Honoka. As Hilo grew, there were a number of areas with their own names like Shinmachi and Kimiville, as well as NAS, or Naval Air Station, near what is now the Hilo International Airport. At that time, the town went right to the water, as you can see from this series of photos from the late 1800s to the 1940s. Hilo had a thriving community near the bay that stretched from downtown all the way to Waiakea. The area was a typical waterfront community with stores, homes, and docks, as well as areas for families to fish and enjoy the water. 
All of that changed on April Fool's Day, April 1st, 1946, at 7 a.m., when a series of tsunami waves swept into Hilo Town. They say it was tidal wave, and people didn't believe it. They thought it was April Fool's Day. People were excited, you know, running all over. And as, as a small boy, I went outside, look, and I saw the, the, the water line coming up. There was a store called, I think it was Kababayan store, and this wave was just as high as the building, about 30 feet, I think. We saw this whole ocean empty out, and it went out as far as you could see, there was no water in this ocean. And then we stood, we stood and waited and watched, and here came this huge wave that was as big as Mauna Kea. And so we decided to run, and we went through a two-story house and uh, went up to the second floor of the house, and the water filled the whole bottom floor. 159 people died statewide, and 96 of those perished in Hilo. Back in, at that time in the 1940s, we were very much a seaport town built right on down to the water so that many of the structures that were demolished were right at water's edge. The areas hardest hit were from the, uh, the Bayfront area, from the Wailuku to the Wailoa rivers. Many of the casualties um, of the 1946 tsunami were in the Wailoa River area called Shinmachi, which means New Town. And it was home to um, a lot of Japanese immigrants that uh, either owned their own businesses and um, lived upstairs, had their business downstairs, or they worked the sugar plantations. Hilo was devastated and it took some time to recover and rebuild the different areas of the town. The tsunami also wiped out the train system in and around Hilo. This changed the sugar industry, which decided not to rebuild and moved to trucking sugar instead. Another tsunami struck Hilo May 23, 1960, at 1 a.m., and took 61 lives. Although no larger than the 1946 waves, the damage to Hilo was even greater this time around. In 1960, over 200 homes were destroyed, over 500 businesses and public buildings, $50 million in damage uh, was caused, parking meters were bent over horizontally by the force of the waves. It really altered the entire city uh, quite drastically. Um, after the tidal wave, which, which left all of Waiakea uh, area uh, demolished, and um, half of the town of Hilo across the Wailua River was demolished as well. And it was decided that not, rather than to rebuild the city, that they would uh, forbid any more construction of any buildings whatsoever along the, the coast there on half of Hilo Bay. It's because of these tsunamis that Hilo has a green belt along the bay and in the Wailoa River area. As a memorial to what happened that day, a clock that was knocked off its foundation and stopped at 5 after 1 a.m. was salvaged and erected along the golf course on Kamehameha Avenue, where it still stands today. In that period, right after the tidal wave, as is common after disasters, the people all pulled together and everybody kokua, everybody helped each other. And it was really quite an experience for the a few years after the tidal wave to see the, how the community came together so that everybody uh, was able to get back on their feet. It's this spirit of community and Hilo's ability to get past the difficult times that has helped to make it a wonderful place to live. For those who grew up here, Hilo holds special memories. I graduated in 1948 from Hilo High, and we were the only high school here in Hilo. All the kids would come in from the country. Hilo town was quiet, and everybody knew everybody. And if I walked around the block, two times. By the time I got home, my mom knew. I walked around the block two times and she and I had to be questioned why. <laughs> and it was just a small town. We'd walk down from, from high school down to Hilo Drug and everybody would sit around the booths and share one soda. And uh, 
and it was just, we just had real close friends and like I say, everybody knew everybody. All the parents knew everybody and we all went to the same schools. And, uh, so it was really a small town back then. We moved to Lanakila Homes, I think in 1952. They had four blocks. Today, you know, block four is, is, you know, standing there, uh, the administration all, you know, in disrepair. But Lanakila was a wonderful place when I look back, growing, growing up there. A lot of friends, a lot of kids, a lot of families. You can either call you, you can be poor and, and poor me, but we never felt that way, you know? We just went on with our lives, our neighbors, they were struggling too. And others that lived not in Lanakila, that had their own, I thought they were, wow, they were rich, yeah? Mm -hmm. But they were struggling too. I had friends, you know, growing up around, and they knew about this place called Gates. It was a place to go, go fishing. And uh, the pond was Gates because of the gates, you know? I guess they opened it in and out. And uh, on, the, on this side of the pond, and the island is there, you know? And uh, there was a, like a walkway you could cross over. And in the middle of the, this Wailo River was this island here. And, and uh, they, they had a Pake band over here. We call him Chaki, uh, Charlie Pake. So Charlie Pake would sit in that, he was, he, he was a caretaker of this, uh, this pond here. So if you wanted to fish on this side of the pond, where, you know, where he lived, then Whatever you caught, you had to give it to him or sell it to him, to Charlie Pake. Now, whatever you caught on the other side of the house, that was open, you know, you could take it to the fish market, like take it down to Aloha Fish Market or uh, Kawachikas, I guess there was a fish market called Kawachikas in down there, Waikia Town, uh, right across from uh, where, where Suisan is today, yeah? We grew up during the war years, which was depression, it was uh, suppression, it was, uh, you know, you'd come to school feel, feeling uh, you gotta have your gas mask. I mean, you went to, uh, we had to go to the chamber and, you know, breathe and, and making sure your eyes don't burn. Um, we always had to have the gas mask with us. A lot of us boys do end up in the gym Waikia gym. Today you see the clock there. That's the only thing you can see in Waikia town. It's just a clock. In the back of that clock, we used to be a gym, a big, big gym. Hilo was known for his basketball, basketball. So and that's that's why I, what I did. I like I love basketball, so I played basketball, and was able to get a scholarship. I went to University of Hawaii. But Hilo High uh, was about 2,000 students, 54, 53, 54. Yeah, we took territory champ. Um, it was a big thing for us, you know. Hilo, I don't know what it's like to grow up any place else. Hilo is the only place I know. Uh, and um, I love the, the rocks. We, were, we grew up on rocky bays. We had no idea what sandy bays were all about. Um, we knew how, to, when and where to swim and uh, what places to avoid that you don't go swimming. So swimming was our biggest recreation. Of course, you live in the island, swimming is big recreation. But it wasn't smooth water. You know, always had waves, always pounding. Uh, Kealkaha, it has to do with this ocean out here. It has to do with two different currents that constantly move in, in two different directions, right at the edges of, of the ocean out here, and that's what it was named for for the for these currents, and so if you're aware of that, and you're and you go to the ocean, you have to always be careful about where the currents are, where they're moving. Otherwise, you're going to be in Tahiti. Hilo is a unique place with deep Hawaiian roots and multicultural background. Today, Hilo has become the center of a thriving East Hawaii community with people from all over the world. It's also become a center for the revival of Hawaiian culture through hula and Hawaiian language at the University of Hawaii Hilo. The hula has done a great job here in Hilo and it all, it all has to do with the Marimonok. Because when you come to the Marimonok, you have to be able to um, live up to the rules and regulations that the Marimonok persist on. And one of them is you do hula kahiko um, according to the dictates of the time before 
1900s. In order for them to come to Mary Monarch and to win at Mary Monarch, they had to be able to do that. Hula Awana has always been something that you do spontaneously. Hula Kahiko is something that you have studied for a long time. And so the, the revival again of Hula in, in Hilo, uh, I mean, Hula, Hilo takes the credit for that. The revival of language itself and the movement um, the, to get it up to the standard that it is today really comes from this, this college. And along with those also comes um, the revival of culture. Hilo has a rich cultural heritage and vibrant history. As we move into the future, it's important to pass down knowledge and values to the next generation so that the special qualities of this place live on. So I want to pass on to the next generation uh, all of my experiences so that uh, they have that opportunity to uh, have a better life and uh, go on with Hawaiian values and uh, be good citizens. It's from that Hawaiian, yeah, that I, when I was a young boy, I, I, I somehow, you know, absorbed and picked up from others or my kupuna and that, just that special aloha. Yeah, the KK to me is very important that uh, we try to reach them and give them an opportunity to, to uh, you know, go forward and be a successful citizen and contributing citizen. But that child should be given every opportunity, especially in a, uh, for education. I have to live the example of what I'm trying to pass on. I have to be the kumuhula. I have to be the one that do the workshops. I have to pull them in when I'm doing all of this so that they, they learn the value as both of us move along um, together. So it's not so much talking down to them, it's sort of bringing them along with you so that you learn some of the things together and then, uh, uh, but you can also um, put in some of your own experiences and your own knowledge and those things that you learned uh, as part of that um, movement of learning for both you and your generations after you. The Hawaiian values are not only in the interrelational type of uh, words that we, we have like aloha, but it has to do with the land as well. It has to be with the connection to the land and the connection between one another um, in relationship to how we get along together. So. Uh, it's really important that our children are connected to the land. There's so much uh, uh, tendency for us to be adopting other kinds of cultures because we're bombarded through media and through the, the general American culture. We're bombarded with all kinds of other ideas and other values. Of course, the most well-known value um, in the Hawaiian lexicon is uh, aloha. It has to do with how we treat one another. That, that is, if we recognize that each other has, has an intrinsic value in that he has, shares the same breath breathed into us by the Creator, then that person has the same value as we do as far as how we should relate to them and how we should value each other. So with that kind of, of a foundational truth, if our children are taught that from the very beginning, then they will treat other people as they want to be treated themselves. It's really important that we are able to maintain our identity, our language, and our cultural values as children because uh, these are what really will f set the foundation for what, how our next generations will be able to function and will be able to care for one another and will be able to prosper and thrive.